Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Palmerston Library, um, Palmerston Library Theatre. My name is Yana. I'm Dylan Ryan here, and I'm delighted to be able to uh, welcome everyone today um, to a very special event, which is a first for us uh, um, in the series. Um, this is our first Saturday um, Poetry and Music Salon with our wonderful local library friend, very regular user and um, well-known artist in your community, Rhonda Close, who has very energetically uh, organized these monthly salons for a while and you probably usually find her on Markham Street in one of the galleries. We very eagerly um, jumped in um, and agreed to partner uh, today and see how it works, whether the space is a good fit for those kinds of events. So, uh, I would like to thank Yana for her generosity and help with uh, uh, setting this up and organizing it and uh, posting it in the library system and bringing in the sound tech. And it's, it's fabulous. This is a uh, my first time um, running a poetry and music salon in the library, and uh, there's a very good chance uh, I may be moving here permanently uh, later in the year. I've always run them in art galleries so far, so this will be a different experience. <laughs> um, so we've got an incredible afternoon uh, ahead of us with some just brilliant poets and musicians, Luciano and Rob and Margaret and Tom, and uh, some great open mics. And uh, so welcome to Palmerston Library. Welcome to the March 2016 Poetry and Music Salon. And like, whoa, you, we're here. <laughs> and uh, we're going to start with um, Stanley Pfefferman, who it turns out I've known for a very long time. Yeah, I took his class many years ago at York. Um, welcome, Stanley. Yeah, those lights are fun. Uh, thank you, Brenda. So this one is called Getting It. This is a theater. Every move is real. The world is watching. You are naked. The darkness is all around. Here in the circle of light, it is rose and gold and blue and alive. My body is warm. My thoughts dissolve easily. I am in love with intelligence. I can wait. My cave is full of butterflies. Thank you. Uh, if that's all it's going to be, we just hold it to the end. I would say it by Brenda. And even if it feels like more, hold it to the end. Thank you. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll just sort of get knocked off my center by the impact. This one is called New. You are beautiful but crumpled. Behind you is window, is wind, rain in maples. Deep in your eyes is lightning. Your mind is feathers. Tickle me. It is not for me to say more than, I am here. Four. One. The beautiful vanishing day with its sunshine and trees, kids, dogs, and nicely dressed people in their clever cars shining in the sun, babies and birds chirping their preferences, and even if no one is there to tell you what to do with yourself, you could go on with your breathing. Try moving your fingers in a rhythm over something. Invite a peaceful feeling, 
like a Buddha sitting in stillness, like rock in sand, more so. Two, longing pours from you like blood. There are moments unseen by you, startled. You come back to more of the same old thing. We can only, I hope, imagine that when the time comes to blame that we have someone handy, <coughs> try to sleep. <laughs> Three, it is raining outside. What is thundering? The sounds are of children thumping and of their voices speaking as they do, loud, yelling everything in shrill. Four, it is good to wear yellow in a brightly lit room on Friday at five, darkening during an autumn thunder shower. Graduation. Oh, we have prize winners here. Ah, the air, my tentacles in space. Ah, when you pass like a gorgeous fish, I am the water-driven seaweed singing in praise of us. How fabulous we are, how gorgeous, how jealous I am of us. We may well say we pity the Queen of England. We who can, can conglomerate being so full of the vicissitudes of life. Giselle's eyes blazing, her lips are torrents of candied raspberry, around her hangs the aroma of peaches, smells burst from her breasts, dissolve into the walls, her hips are not flat, no, rolling they are, fat and rolling soft. Manfred's eyes are brittle, bulletproof limousine. His body moves in moonlight. Menace is his walkway. Oh, look out. He comes. Space trembles, holding its breath so tight. Great boulders teeter on the precipice of his intention. Ice ages begin to unfold under his feet. Her calls him. He guns. He guns. Winds unpeel his skin, rock slides are dust on his shoulders, tigers lurk in his belly, and his balls suck wind in the cavernous night. The family sits on the sofa, on various chairs, on the floor sit the kids, the dishes are still on the table, in the sink, all over the kitchen. Sun shines in, sun shines in, the glass coffee table, the shadow down the basement stairs, the cellar, dust plays in the sunbeam, plays, hangs, dances, who knows what dust does. Anyway, dinner is over, everyone is feeling fat and happy and ready to begin to complain. Thank you. Uh -huh. the group on Facebook, it's Victoria. So welcome, Victoria. Well, just a little bit about me. Um, melancholia is my name, not get to know me. What a shame, you miss abject bleakness that is soulful, darkest dreariness that is sublime, bluest funks that are delightfully woeful, and a downhearted cheer cheerfulness that is so divine. Wings, mortal vessel, burnt offering, morph back to your original charcoal creation to continue the cycle of evolutionary transformation. Something liberating, living large in the narrow, this narrow world of impotent false inception. We are but reincarnate birth canal extrusions, entities born into a cycle of shock, anger, pain, and grief. 
roaming endlessly, searching desperately for synthesized opiate relief. Bartering, bargaining, we think with angels, who are most likely devils in disguise. Inevitably, to be black dog swallowed, becoming chewed cud, then spit out, spit back out at a time unknown to us, a regurgitation that readies us once again for further self-reflection. Feelings of loneliness and loss wash over us like waves lapping against the shore of our solitary existence. Acceptance? Hope? Do we do it all over again? I don't know. Why not take a knife, cut losses, and peacefully drift away on a bed of clouds wrapped in a blanket of angels' wings? Empty page, new beginning. Slate is cleared once again. Chalk drawings, brush white. I am ready to write that which will be my new life. They say when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Open are my listening ears, waiting patiently for wisdom extolled. Lessons written between the lines, invisible but visible only to those whose eyes are ready to see to where it flows. As if by osmosis, awareness inserts itself, resting, stealing a place. I don't know where until it reveals without warning. This is how it goes. This is how it's been. Every 10 years, it happens once again. Take the journey between the lines, unseen to the destination. Twix and Twain. One day it's a blessing, the next it's a curse. Sometimes better, other times worse. Devil res resides the devil, left shoulder it sits. Taunts me, teases me, at times pleases me. Resides an angel, right shoulder it dwells. Praises me, heals me, at times releases me. Then there's the place in between, where somewhere meets nowhere, where you're seen and unseen. Duplicity, Gemini twin, dichotomy deuce, duet in the wind, walking twain, shall they ever meet on the corner of this and that street? Fork in the road, split down the middle, which road to take, finally solve this riddle. Mind's eye, I lost my marbles long ago, to where they went I do not know. Could you help me find them please, to finally breathe and be at ease? You see them there, I know you do, in your mind's eye, red, green, and blue. They're rolling round some distant place between two worlds in outer space. In darkness there, I know they lay, do shine a torch to light their way. Bring them home where they belong so I can finally sing my freedom song. Gallery, um, where I had a solo show and I started running the, the poetry salons um, and followed me out here to Market Street, which is lovely, and heading out to the library. So I'm so happy to have you and welcome. And I will read two pieces. They're very new, so I haven't titled them yet. I'm very nervous, so I might stumble over my words. Sorry. <laughs> I find between your hair the legend of my mind, telling your story in full, which you clench tight between your jaws. But it also has holes, like white print on white. Just the way your eyes withhold the fine print, I've come to scan out and suddenly sink in to a deeper depth, till sweetly I'm in, invading your secret. The one you hoped someone would crack, while mending the other, scarring your chest. From the thunderous night that struck you point blank, your soul the bull's eye, did your palm caught in your hand's blinds, 
I loyally, lovingly hold, hoping I, hoping I understand the age that has struck you, your gray hair, the ratio to the wounds in my eyes. And the second one. Hmm, it is so soft beneath your pain. I cannot, I cannot help being your pee on which you can't sleep on at night. It is sort of warm beneath your cover, your bliss I've pulled onto my side, warmed while you tremble bare feet. It is so soothing drinking your zest, aged into dark and sweet red wine, while you're the broken leftover legs. It's your white I made a mess of after a staining spill and bitterness you can smell long after my stupor. It's your spark I used to thaw by, which your blows it could withstand, always futile to my gas. You cannot, you cannot wait to put it out, nor outrun the, the nearing flames. It's so warm here by your fire. Thank you. Open mic before our first feature is Kirk. He's going to play. Play a song. He's going to play a song. Hi there, I'm Kirk Felix. I'm from Richmond Hill. I spent a lot of time in the G8 here in Toronto. And uh, you know, I know Tom Hamilton. He accompanies me. I'd like to do a, 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 a song that I wrote in 1970, the very first song, and all songs start with poetry, and this is a perfect place to present this, and I'm going to use uh, an intro on this from um, a, a beat poet in the States who passed away a few years ago, named Rod McEwen, you should probably be familiar with him. And, uh, I need to plug this real quick. I just re-released my seat of my album from 1971, 72, and this song is on this album, and it will be available if you're interested. But the song is called Christine, and I uh, I called the uh, the lyrics that I'm using from uh, the, the lines I'm using from Rod McEwen to the sea because basically it's, it's what it's described, and it's from uh, his his writings from uh, Listen to the Warm and stand in street and other sorrows. You've been so long at the beach, you even taste like the sun. But the sun is much too warm even for love. Meanwhile, watch the inland butterfly playing on the tall flower in the yard. And think about the sun's going down. It always does, you know. How can we be sure of anything? The tide changes. The wind that made the green wave gently yesterday blows down the trees tomorrow. And the seas send sailors crashing on the rocks as easily as it guides them home. And I love the sea, but it doesn't make me less afraid of it. And I love you, but I'm not always sure of how you are or what you are.
as cold as it can be. And I want her to run with me along the beautiful sea. But I turn and look around me, find she is gone. Somewhere, somehow, they say she's moved along, and I want her to be with me all day and night time long, being close beside me. We could sing our happy songs. The wind Among the rustling leaves And I stand alone thinking Of what used to be So I'll go my lonely travels Being what I must be Someday we might meet again and be happy. We were free and be happy. That we Thank you so much, Kirk and Tom. Uh, they will be back for the last half an hour of our salon. And uh, you know we're going to enjoy. <laughs> Luciano Iacovelli is a Toronto poet, playwright, visual artist. Uh, Luciano is the author of The Angel Notebook, Painting Circles, The Book of Disorders, um, and Robert, and also Emu, the Emu Dialogues. It's not on here. <laughs> They're going to be reading from the Emu Dialogues, which is um, logic on its, well, whatever. What would you say? Logic on its, yeah, on its left Logic ear. On Logic on vacation. <laughs> uh, Robert Mara. Mara is an author, visual artist, psychotherapist. He's the author of a long, concrete poem entitled "The Word," and uh, he often combine he often combines words and images in his art. And he's shown his painting in various spaces throughout Toronto. The Emu Dialogues is the first major appearance of Robert's literary work. Welcome these two wonderful <laughs> men and poets and artists. I'm trying to be video Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you guys for coming out on a shopping day. Um, yeah, this is good, right? Yeah. <clears throat> And, and thank the library too. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Thank everybody. Thank everybody. And uh, just to say, although the Emu Dialogues um, has not been getting a lot of Canadian attention, but the international press really loves this book. Like in China, they're saying, "Who needs a great wall?" The Emu Dialogues will repel the enemy. In France, they're saying. Uh, 
if steak tartare could write, uh, EU dialogues would be its diary. And in Italy, they're saying EMU Dialogues is proof that the souls of Cicciolina and Topo Gigio have mated. This is their child. Now, if uh, any of you don't get those references, Cicciolina and uh, <coughs> Topo Gigio, EMU is designed so that if uh, you get the reference, you feel good about yourself and smug. If you don't get the reference, you feel inadequate. So that, that is pretty much one, one of the things about EMU. Do you want to add anything, Rob, or am I going to be talking all the time? No, you said it all. You said it all. Okay, so, so uh, EMU is actually, just to give you a bit of an introduction to what EMU is, it's a cult. And uh, it's been going on for about 40 years. We actually, at the end of the book, at the very the back of the book, there's a list of all the people that have emued um, and uh, a history of our influences. Uh, for example, the IKEA catalog is an influence. <laughs> and uh, that great uh, Roman uh, chef, Apicius. <laughs> back in the Now magazine. The Back in the Now magazine classified. So those are our influences, but I actually we do have a history at the back of the book and a list of our influences. We, let's read a bit of the introduction, Rob, as to what EMU is. So wait, when do you need the video on? Now. No. <laughs> yes. When well, we start to read. When we start to read the word. When we start to read the word. Yeah. Okay. So um, in every friendship, a mental and spiritual dialect originates to serve the unique experiences and expressions yeah. indigenous to that relationship. In our case, the dialect has a name and it is called Inu. The sound you hear when the phrase he is me and I am you is spoken at light speed. Some okay, so Rob, Rob, so he is me and I am you spoken at light speed. So Inu. So that's what you say. So the turning of the head represents light speed. And you, believe it or not, if you hear anything spoken at light speed, your head will turn quickly. <laughs> uh, so we honor the emu because it is the most haphazard creature made up of scrap parts of other birds. It stands to the left of nature as a kind of marginalia, one of God's notes on creations. Excellent. Emu is for homo ludens, a playful form of linguistic desperation in which our inner child offers its milk teeth to the sun, hoping to bribe itself out of kindergarten. It is the same child picking up a seashell, running naked in the sand, robbing the beach of its ice cream. Now let me let it be understood. There is no set definition of emu, and the attempt to define it is just Zeno pimping another paradox. Instead of asking what is emu, pay your hearing bill, buy a side glance, rent your ifs to the ifless, ask yourself why is an orange. It is from this question all emu begins, and tie your viper answer to the loafing wrists of divine apathia. If you are reading this or listening to this, chances are you have the kind of face only a library could love. <laughs> and you're not dating much, so stay home, cuddle up with our words, and grow a second navel. You deserve it. <laughs> so I think that's a bit of an introduction to, to the spirit of you. Go ahead, Rob, interrupt me. What if they already have two navels? <laughs> Never thought of it. So the book is um, uh, was written actually by myself, Robert, and Jens Kohler, who lives in LA. He couldn't make it today. Uh, and it includes collaborative pieces and some solo pieces. And this is uh, actually a solo piece that Robert composed. And it's entitled Words. This is what it looks like. And now we're going to listen to what part of it um, sounds like, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it started off as a, a piece, um, actually one day I had very little to do at work and I wanted to no annoy Luciano. So I decided to send him, um, you know, countless metaphors describing the word in a form of lecturing him or pontificating. And he wrote back and just said, hey, look, this sounds kind of interesting. And what it evolved into was an experimental 36-page um, 
work that you're about to hear a bit of and see what we up on the, uh, on the screen. So, <clears throat> the word, an eagle's screech, the word, a snake's hiss, the word, a bear's growl, the word, a horse's snort, the word, a monkey's grunt, the word, a dog's bark, the word, a cat's meow, the word, an owl's hoot, the word, a pig's oink, the word, a duck's quack, the word, a cow's moo, the word, bird's chirp, the word, a tiger's roar, the word, chirp, meow, hiss, moo, oink, chirp, hiss, snort, hoot, oink, oink, meow, moo, bark, quack, bark, chirp, squeak, quack, jerk, squeak, hiss, hoot, hoot, oink, moo, bark, quack, bark, Chirp, chirp, chirp. <laughs> the word, a mantra to instill inner calm, confession and liberation, scaffolding built of prayer and hope, the patron saint of your village, sacred tablets for Moses, the word, a mecca to gaze towards, seeds to sow of Eden, the mass and form you fill with soul, the soul you form and fill with mass. The mass and form you fill with soul, the soul you form and fill with mass. The word, the Brahmin Sanskrit, the priest's Bible. The word, the, the pr pr Brahmin pr Sanskrit, the priest's Bible. The prime, the prime sky word, the rabbi's prime in sky the word. The Brahmin, the the word, the rabbi's Torah, the prime, the primitive center school, the Bible, the word, the Imam Quran, Saint Tor Sky, Saint Primor Center Prime Centaur Scribble, Center Scribble, the word, the Imam's Quran, the word, the monks Mahayana Sutras, the Primamami Bhang Sent Sutras, Mahayana Sutras, the Prime Bhang Sent Sutras, the Word Shaman's Rattles, the Primamami Bhang Sent Sutras, the Word Shimmy Bhang Sent Sutras, the Scabble, the Word the Shaman's Rattles, Prashami Mami Bhang Sent Sutras, Scan and Skibble, Ishka Bibble. The Word. Recipes to prepare what you desire. The word, you a baby's wail. Desire the word, wail. a prison guard that keeps thoughts on awful thoughts contained. contained. The word, young. a mother that devours its young. Tormented. The word, a soother that passes. Tantrums. Tantrums. Mother. An addict. Schizophrenia. Mother. The word, an antipsychotic remedy for your schizophrenia. Transgressions, word, its inheritance, word, its awkward. Vegetarian transgressions. Nakedness. Word, memory that won't stop spending even after squandering its inheritance. With its own the word, the fashion that conceals an awkward. Fastness. The word, an arrogant imagination impregnated with love. love fast trembling. The word, hand. The compromises you make for love. The word, a cigarette. From judge and, and jury, your word, tears. The angel that protects you from judge and jury. Your the word, a pillow for your super tears. Ego. The word, the libido super ego. Cir the circular. Word, notes in the pine. Pine. Reassure your circular pine. Flailing body. Straight jacket. Spies. Flailing body. Masticist the word, love. Comfort in disguise concealing you from spies. The word, a saddest masochist. In your word, head, a restless. Love. The word, Sleep. A cream that entangles the knots in your head. Your the word, baggage is petrified. To a restless sleep. The word, Thoughts. A psychoanalyst who offers you a rail car to place your baggage. Console word, you. Petrified thoughts. The word of you desire. You. Thank you. is actually a collaboration between Robert and I. It's a, a real bona fide Emu dialogue, a true Emu dialogue, and it's entitled Leonard Cohen. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, the two uh, main characters are Sir Zig 
and Sir Zag, right? Am I Sir Zig today? You're Sir Zig. You're Sir Zig. I'm Sir Zig, Sir Zag. Yeah. And, and what's happened is Sir Zig and Sir Zag have gotten wind that Leonard Cohen has gone bankrupt. Um, and that um, emotionally and materially, I guess. So what they want to do is they are putting together a tragic comedy, a play. Uh, they're going to stage it and raise money for Leonard Cohen. So, <clears throat> so shall we start? Let's start. They're going to talk about what they need for their production. We'll require some props along the perusal a refurbishment, a multi-sided indignation, a dozen false hopes freshly picked by migrant workers, five gondolas, and the Casanova. The Casanova must come with a repair kit. Two postponements, two slight hesitations, but only if they're in season and they jingle jangle morning. <laughs> And we'll need the following characters. A calendar's wet nurse, a gobbly gook repairman, a resolution inhibitor, a circumference whisperer, a polisher of cocoa, a needy fix installer, an abyss appraiser, and someone who'll give good solstice to the lead actor. <laughs> and let's not forget a Trevi Fountain impersonator. The impersonator is essential. He is the play's catastrophe, the greasy handshake of the tragedy. His left profile must resemble an overcooked paella, and his right profile must be Pittsburgh. His nose should be a shamed mountain exiled from the Andes. He should be a religious man who mistakes God for post-war American furniture. His celibacy should be owned by Connie Francis, Sister of the famous saint. <laughs> Some production notes. Because Leonard Cohen is a man of delicate absences and silences, it is mandatory that this play be performed in an empty theater. The drama can only be implied forever on the verge of unmasking itself. Never stepping out into actuality. The characters must never appear. The play should be trapped in a pregnancy. So happy in itself, it requires nothing to be born. Notes regarding music. <clears throat> One long extended score, a ghostly symphony of resonances. It should bring to mind the lovemaking of cucumbers. The first part of the piece should be played on Dante Alighieri. It should build up into a passionate chili con carne and then wind down into a soft, elegiac Joe DiMaggio. <laughs> My stalactites are swimming in the bouillon of your genius. In the mean street time, I'd like to build on your aleph. Let's consider these subtitles. Act zero or acts hero, lunch with the poet. At Arrow, or Zach Arrow, Leonard Cohen splits the atom. At Roe, or Zach Roe, Siddhartha Leonard Cohen and his accountant in the temple of the Grand Masturbator. <laughs> At O, or Zach Roe, Leonard Cohen on Mount Atlantis. And finally, Act or Leonard Cohen on the Empire State Building, fighting off helium-filled poet laureates. Fertilize those subtitles and pickle them in current events, my friend. It's our absent actors that concern me. I'm now more inclined toward hiring traditional actors. You know, the insignificant and disposable kind. Stapled all over with narcissism and afflicted with overbearing presence. I suggest we use five actors for every character. Once their performance has ended, each character can go stage right, join a large circle, bend over at the hips, pucker the lips, and become part of a perpetual ass-kissing installation. <laughs> also, I have a thought regarding music. There should be a marriage between the ghostly resonance symphony and a delayed or non-existent adagio tomo revolver. The tonal quality should be as follows. <laughs> I 
I believe that this can help create a classical head on sheet metal effect. <laughs> but if the music is going to be so grand, we'll need a hundred snowshoe caregivers. Every time Leonard Cohen offers a soliloquy or lament, eyes looking upward towards an empty balcony, these caregivers should goose step a minuet on a dance floor of flames. Thunder will back them up. Throughout the dance, Leonard should speak softly, words piled high like discarded chicken wings, so high that they rival the Chrysler building. They should cast a shadow long enough to obscure the sun's machismo. Leonard's mother must always be nearby, insisting that he eat one more spoonful of Jocasta chicken soup. <laughs> During all of this, the self-portrait that Leonard keeps in his wallet regresses to infancy. And this cannot be staged without a scribberator or a singer of flat feet harmonies accompanied by a Macedonian bladder whistler. We'll also need a miracle permission expert, a second chance monopolizer, an audience retainment waller, and a recurring fecundator. <laughs> Let's have Leonard speak the prologue. He should wear his Sunday best Buddhism with his karma unbuttoned at the top. <laughs> He'll sit at the front of the stage in the bogus position, puffing on a cigarette. The smoke should hover around him like a groupie. And he should recite the following. The play's the thing, the play's the thing to make you sing, to make you swing, the play's the thing, the play's the thing, the play's that sing, the ace that sings, it's Freud in the void, listening to Pink Floyd, it's Jesus eating cheeses, he looks it, and he sneezes, it's God in the sod looking mighty odd, it's Scrabble for the rabble who dabble in their pity, for the big old ugly city who cry for rundown places and all the homeless faces. The play's the thing. The place, the thing, the place that rings. We raise the wings, the ways that sin, the waste that's thin. Bada boom, bada bing, the place, the thing. <laughs> <laughs> what a profound dialogue, prologue. Like cowbells stampeding on pigeons, we'll have Leonard recited inside a dark and transparent wood filled with microphones and pound cake, perennials that grow beside beautiful galvanizations. Leonard should look around with great regard for what may or may not unfold. The snowshoe caregivers, bedecked in savage milligrams, will wander aimlessly through the flora. Our trophy fountain impersonator should also be seen emanating desperation from his Versace Simonista suit. He pushes a rickshaw full of burdens. His mother follows him, urging, Seek your next voice, my son! Seek your next voice! And let your old voice hitchhike across the millennium in the gelatin of its own inbreeding. <laughs> Another character spies all that is going on, someone who can disperse the light. Perhaps you, my friend, in Hitchcockian manner, can make a cameo appearance, but you must do it cross-dressed. Wearing the pastimes of an idiot. And you should appear as a Hallmark card dipped in nasal spray, taped to the shiny shell of a childhood disgrace. <laughs> but that would make our play a comedy, and you know what the Italians say. La commedia è ricotta. <laughs> That's all we're reading from this. <laughs> But there's still a couple. Oh, and we can I read one solo effort here from one solo effort, and then we will end it. And because because I'm feeling it, I'm feeling the love. I'm going to read a love song to all of you. Again, because I feel the love. <clears throat> love song. Her prayers were filtered nightingale breasts. The dawn was her brazier. She corseted herself with icebergs and alluvial deposits. She sold mammals to the jungle. She baited the geranium of half past three. Her body's square root straddled a parenthesis. 
Miserere's were detained in her spleen. The weathers met in her mouth and exchanged snowdrifts. Icicles filleted her inner light. She poured sunset oil over her vision and lubricated her vistas. She bribed the rocks with pilgrim's feet and centipedes. She wore a scent called homicide and wrapped her howls in cellophane. She nursed my hermit heart, and I polished her buttocks till they shone like dolphins diddling the shore. I told her matter is constipated light, and her uterus took me in like a handy wipe, soaking up a spill. Tautology, she yelled, in her, and wheeled her musk across the agora. <laughs> I spilled her coffee over my mortal sins. Her eyebrows splashed in the shallows of a deep sentiment. In her smile were parked a brand new Fiat Lux and a vintage Kundalini. We made love on a bed of persimmons. She put my stutter in her palm, and I felt like a good man opening up a can of virtue. I sang her a song of wood and glass, closed eyes in the wind, oh, cold sighs of the window, closed thighs, cold ice of the window in the widow, her closed eyes, ghost ice, closed like a window, the widow of the wind. We strolled to Mount Palomar and kissed the telescopes underneath the open-mouthed Rig Vedas. My tongue cruised her neck for a baby moon and found one. It looked like apple pie spray-painted silver. It tasted like a fireman reaching up to save a life. She asked me, why do you like the beach so much? I said, because I want to buy the ocean. I'm waiting for my bid to ripen. She unbuttoned my pants, and they dropped to the ground like the last act of Hamlet. We swam to the ocean's crawl space, discovered a shipwreck illuminated by the light of its own tragedy. I know this place. This is where my mother negotiated my complexion, haggled for my skin, I said. This is where she nailed together her breast milk. She handcuffed me to the current and corrected me. This is where rhythm casts away the body and fends for itself. Thank you very much. interested in helping her, please speak to her. Uh, it doesn't look like they're going to be able to keep the same name, but it could be the Art Bar Revival or... Uh, and so she's collecting quite a group of people around her to, uh, to help keep it going because 25 years is just too long to give up on. Yes, right. Right on. On Monday, the 28th of March, at the Butler's Pantry at 7 p.m. in the evening. If you feel like volunteering, come on out, and find out what the roles are, and see if you can find a slot to fit into. My poem for today is called Dreams. Degrees, career, marriage, prosperity, one by one they drifted skyward. Soared and sailed, bright kites on currents. Some caught mid-flight, webbed naked branches like cotton candy, those ordinary dreams of youth and middle years. Today, I float the dreams of advancing time, time and inspiration, health to enjoy late days, happy interludes with family, friends, 
financial needs for comfort and the odd trip or luxury. Enjoying energy and youthful enthusiasm, I still do not feel old, but I know I'll be old when my dreaming's done. Thank you so much, Margaret. And the next up to mic is a lady I met fairly recently at Vino Rosa Linda Stitt Sports and Music, Sahara. Welcome. Thank you. I have to sit down because I'm so tired. I was on the phone this morning for an hour and a half trying to pay my Rogers cable bill. It's a very difficult trans transgression. And on the way down here, the taxi, taxi driver, all he talked about was John Gomeshi, but I call him John Gomeshi. And he said, these women, they're stupid, ignorant. How'd they go to men's apartments? One day, then his apartment, stupid, ignorant. I said, well, they thought uh, they knew him. You know, he's famous, they heard him on the radio. Stupid, who goes to man's apartment after one day? I said, well, you know, it happens. Sometimes it happens on the first day. Anyways, I thought, what if it was one of Cohen? <laughs> there he is again, I tell you, he's there so much. What if it was Leonard Cohen? You go out with him one day, the next day you go back to his apartment, and he bashes your head with a string of herpes. Tea and oranges, I think that's the king that comes later. Tea and oranges, I don't know what he does with those things. But he sure doesn't eat them. Anyways, this is called Darling. My love affair with Elizabeth Taylor's love affair with jewelry. Elizabeth, in the end, what was there? The jewelry was there, living in like the earth they came from, in and on hard deposits of ice, excruciatingly. Feeding the heart's need for love. Their beauty less astonishing in photographs. Where are the men <laughs> who gifted you with them? Your hearts dark towards each other. Cold like until they die. And reignited a wave of tenderness. Tears washing those diamonds clean. You were so beautiful, Liz. You would have looked gorgeous in dyed sackcloth and glass beads. Why do we put our love, our hopes, and dreams into things we can't? even eat, but are stuck with alone. When the lights go out, they don't even shine. <laughs> um, well, the last open mic is a very special man. Come to many of the salons uh, he, did fe he featured last year, uh, Stedman Party. Let's give it up for the futures one more time. Okay. This is a poem uh, my friend Angelo wanted me to read. It's usually in two parts, but I'll only read part one today. Aboard that packed subway train at rush hour, I was the very portrait of dissociative calm, but on the inside, I cried. A hang glider got struck by a streaking meteorite on the morning after the night 
before I met you. On the morning after the night before I met you, I was spiritually conjoined to a Chinese boy, a Chinese boy whose eyes were gouged out by his beloved aunt. I was altered forever just before I met you, baptized anew, altered forever by the intuitive hunch that I would find you, doggy paddling in the scarred in every way by me, sky of skulls smuggling unwanted vegetation to those of us living in blazing sweatshops transfigured into a lone ziggurat of melting ice yelling, come, come and take a lick of one of our cones, come. Let us march against the powers of heaven and set black streamers in the firmament to signify the slaughter of the gods, come. Come strum your acoustic weapons all over our electric country. This music makes our legs feel like a field of wheat. But a disfigured World War IV veteran and an underappreciated woman discover true love, beauty, and a magical transformation after moving into a small cabin on our sprawling estate. But the, but the, but the pixelated pictures on your laptop screen, the earthling outside reality, the man who fell to earth, counting stars, altered forever by a replenishing infection that hospitalized a glamorously destitute couple, snowshoeing across the prairies in the late summer with the blissful, socially unorthodox, hypersensitive wastrel with a fascinating personality <laughs> on the morning after the night before I met you. On the morning after the night before I met you, crazy horses warriors fought their last major battle at Wolf Mountain. A bank robbery suspect was captured after he posted a picture of himself holding a Star Trek Klingon sword and a submachine gun on Instagram before pulling a violent pet. The RCMP was probing serious new allegations of illegal lobbying by a former advisor to the Canadian Prime Minister. Roaming gangs of chihuahuas were terrorizing the streets in Arizona. 20 people were stabbed at a high school and put, squeezed by the worst ever drought in the state's history. California was dying of thirst and growth. A snow, a timid spermatozoan was nervously awaiting ejaculate. A stupid chick, a stupid chick more useless than parents who can't cook was arrested in Texas for dialing 911 repeatedly because she ran out of cigarette. <laughs> Wednesday's unofficial pick six lottery numbers were 24, 12, si and a sea lion that befriended a rustic youth with Asperger's syndrome was happier than overprotective Russian, Italian, Arabic, Irish. Scottish and Zionist fathers finding out that their favorite, most doted upon daughter is marrying some African Canadian or mulatto dude, interrogating <laughs> Socrates beyond our solar system, probing the furthest reaches of interior space. When my Mustangs almost got turned into dog food on the morning after the night, on the morning after the, on the morning after the night before I met you. Thank you. special poet and writer, uh, somebody who I met probably in the early 2000s. Um, and she's going to feature in June along with Joe Ray. So this is just a taste of Margaret and uh, will inspire you to come back in June and uh, get a much bigger chunk of Margaret. <laughs> uh, Margaret Christakos has published nine collections of poetry, including Multitudes, Welling, uh, a Globe One, um, sorry, a Globe 100 book, uh, Sooner, 
uh, that was a Pat, Pat Lowther Memorial Award nominee, an excessive love prosthesis, a winner of a Relit Award, as, as well as the novel uh, Charisma, and uh, that was a Chile Book Award nominee. And uh, Chris Tackles has designed and facilitated Influency, a Toronto poetry salon from 2006 to 2012, and was a Canada Council Writer in Residence at the University of Windsor in 2004-05. So please welcome a very special woman, Margaret Chris Tackles. Sort of refrains the, uh, the, the, uh, on the on the morning of the afternoon uh, before I met you. Um, blue light. In the afternoon, in the afternoon of a day, in the afternoon of a day of institched thinking, in the afternoon of a day of institched thinking for the corollary, in the afternoon of a day of institched thinking for the corollary of voice. In the afternoon of a day's breath of in-stitch thinking for the corollary of voice in photographs. In the afternoon of an aftermath. In the afternoon of a choir swaying toward a gratuitous affection. In the corollary of all day hour quiet. In the space of day hour in-stitched voices, all the unseen thought is luminous. In bringing in this gorilla, which lurches into soliloquy, this gorilla is bewildered. This gorilla has a body so different it can't be in the room, lacking or having a strand of esophagus garnished in something timid. This elephant, this shark, mastodon, purple loose strife and leeches, elevated in an elevator, then vapor. It's a room in a camera with polyester, fluorescence, aluminum, park squirrels, bioswarm, the fiberglass. Everybody knows it's inebriating. There's a latinerette. You wake one morning, Phyllis Diller wrestles a lion, familial reunion, then voluminous fire gulfs or engorges the community center. Local bricks with explosive bellies, arrow, toxic smoke talks about how lovable we are. It won't shut up, but exudes. Different, different, tenerified. Rows of chairs and grommeted in a factory back room so workers can surf people online and chew nicorettes. It's adolescent lemur stuck in the stalls sideways. Flock of cormorants and juice boxes donated by Nestle. Sleeves bleached properly and histamines distributed, impressive. Seniors paying federal taxes without question. I so enjoy breathing alongside a scenario of refuge when two zoo-born giraffes go up in a figure eight firework, lime green leaf bits showering a petite rainfall on my April hairless forearm. We are as Abelov, as nature is. There are flecks of sanguinity in our sideburned quietude, dusky in-stitched voices, while mature elk herds ligature the building, lobbing homeopathy against multiple extinction rumors. This dictaphone, this morse, this spirograph, capro, and letricet, Peel black its backing, then poster. Burn your thong, take back the night. Hold others to sluggish account. Believe in rainforest for the trees, for what they are bringing in. In bringing in this gorilla which lurches into soliloquy, this gorilla is bewildered. This gorilla has a body so different it can't be in the room, lacking or having a strand of esophagus garnished in something timid. If it could be, it would arise that way. But I think we agree, it cannot. And 
imagining there's a bunch of clouds outside, I thought I would read uh, this piece in which clouds are the guest feature. It's called Lovely One. Clouds are lovely in the valley. I've known the moist movement reach for its thin shelf of provisions. Consolation over chaos knows plenty about poured chords. And you've certainly heard about pleasure. Less is surely the future. Opals for the moment are sleepful. Valley, I've known movement reach for shelves of provisions. Chaos knows plenty of chords, and you've about pleasure less. Some future opal moments are sleepful. Do you know how lovely our clouds are about the sound of opals? You know about this cold portal. You've known this moist movement toward tone, melody over chaotic topography of love, how valley hope forlorns the Mondays through Friday's consolation, a river's montage, sleep on sadness. You know, lovely one. Art inside your name cannot be uncoiled, no itinerary or market. There's a thin shelf of provisions and sustenance to be proven, so little's worth saying. Know how lovely clouds, valley, sound opals about one colder portal. A moist movement tones melody over chaotic love, rivers, any forlorn consolation. Montage, sadness, art, inside name. Uncoiled, no itinerary or market. There's this thin shelf of provisions, sustenance to be proven oval, so little worth saying. Still, saying little, be provisions thin or uncoiled, river, valley, montage, some consolation, chaotic over movement. Colder and oval sound clouds, lovely you. One portal worth the milky shades, the tony hues of love's opals. I was kind of wondering what that would sound like with some of uh, Tom's amazing violin playing. So I'm gonna do a little sound graft when, when you're playing. Um, kind of imagine there might be some interesting um, musicality there. Um, just going to read a little bit from a new book that's coming out uh, this spring. Um, it's kind of creative memoir, uh, writing about my mother lines, um, kind of trying to create some internalized sense of connection to the women of my ancestral past and uh, forward to my daughter. And I'm um, just going to read a little bit. It's an obviously very different voice. First, there was a blizzard, so I went to the lake and just called you. I called you a couple of times. We were friendly after that long talk. We were friendly, oddly felt you saw me as an adult. Perhaps for the first time, I felt on a par. I had been reading all about one of Grandad's lumber camps in the Foliette area, catching wind that maybe it had been appropriated by the government to be used as a Japanese internment camp for a year or two. I had been asking you about your relationship with my father, trying to understand how love worked, did not work between you, why my life was blizzarded by the confusion of love, how it works, how it does not work. You told me things, talked late into the night. So then I went to the lake for three days, read, wrote, talked out loud to myself, walked on the ice, watched the snowbanks melt, wrote the chips and ties study, called you a couple of times, left town on a slow bus through the blizzard, by this point sunlit, iridescent, went back to the place my children are the place they call home, the place I don't really consider home well, that's where I've lived since 1987, so. A couple of nights later you had a terrible stroke, over and over you said, I don't know, I don't know what happened, I don't know. Strokes bloom on the brain, so it was several days before we realized most of the alphabet had been taken, shaken into snow. Words can be erased, is the thing. Um, 
I want to honor the, the, the invitation to be just a guest feature, so that's all I'll read from that. And I'm just going to finish with um, a poem that um, was written in, in Sudbury by the lake, uh, where much of the text for um, her paraphernalia, uh, the book that I just read a little touch from, um, uh, much of the book was written up in Sudbury by Lake Ramsey. And uh, so was this kind of statement of poetics. My politics include art making, silence, thought, looking, scent, location, moment, light, excursions into internal woe. <coughs> my location includes politics. My silence includes you. My moment includes light, worry, despair, defiance, denial, subterfuge, dunking, rock, duck, rock, rock. My woe includes loss, lack, lakes, leaving, love, lastingness. My art making includes, art making includes time, includes woe. My woe includes light. My light includes time. My thought includes porousness, hoarseness, seasons, chaos, hate, quiet, waking, loneliness, politics, hovering. My writing includes gaze, distance, fretting, optimism. My politics include art making, isolation, folds of city, you. My art making includes sitting and contemplating a lake. My listening is lake-ish. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Very much. wonderful Margaret you know you have to hear Margaret you can read her poetry on the page but she's such a terrific reader I mean I could just listen to you for hours so that that was fabulous thank you very much and I'm really looking forward to June and uh, I, I hope we will see a few familiar faces back in June so Thomas Ganon, Ganon Hamilton is a poet, violinist, and producer. He wrote his master's thesis on dub poetry uh, before humanitarian work took him to Central America, where he joined the Salvadorian artist cooperative Tison. Uh, he also was in was the war down there. Yeah. Um, after relocating to Calgary, he completed a doctoral degree uh, focused on the experiences and practices of high school poets. We have a couple of people here who might have. Um, he has published two ebooks of poetry, Bellicose Spains, and, and that a lot of that is on your experience in Salvador and Deer Crossing. And he now lives in Toronto where he performs regularly, and he's a fantastic person. Violinist, fiddler, drumist, I don't know, he can play how many instruments. So he's going to um, share music and some poetry as well. So welcome Tom and Kirk uh, is going to come up with it. in the world to start. I consider everybody here to be part of our wonderful Toronto urban folk community. Nobody comes to any of these events unless they're active. Everybody here is a producer. Everybody here is a co-producer.
over the next few years and very shortly this urban folk community is going to start to emerge and it'll emerge internationally before it does in Canada as you know that's the way things go these days to thank Brenda for having us here and I would also like to thank the Toronto Public Library uh, not only this host institution but the its sister institution up on Mount Pleasant where I host a salon of my own and there will be one taking place on the 31st of this month it goes from 6 to 8 and everybody here is welcome to attend and I have more information about that later. Where in the world would you like to start? What place in the world would you like to go? Put your finger on the proverbial map and somebody yells something out. Here and now. Here and now. Here and now, okay. Well, I guess because we started out in Syria, let's go there then because we were just there. I beg your pardon? How much is the plane fare? <laughs> it costs you nothing. That's too much for me.
along the aisle, starch collar, dark ribbon tie, a frail brutality, his respectable inheritance of pain fled through the crawl space of his eyes. A tape tightening in that face turned elastic lips whiter than his teeth, and listing gravity, one straight arm in torsion pressed a spring steel spider his hand on the desktop of the boy in front a sidelong talker whose tousled hair encroached upon earlobes and conventions the man more carefully posed than his remark get it cut <laughs> you look like a girl Every head was hung. No feminine pupil moved. Bernie and me. My buddy Bernie, who stopped binge eating about a year ago and swapped it for browsing power foods, now forages in the fridge. And in the frigid atmosphere, we cross-country ski through man-made coniferous woods when they are least odoriferous, knowing those without enough strength to stand, who don't sit so well either with my friend or me, and can't even lie if starving is a truth told through exposure as the timbers show through from behind that billboard showing two women posed in bogus intimacy. Closer to a so-called girly magazine centerfold than a fashion shot or progressive statement, as equally, though differently starved minds will take it, the way a fake forest lures mammals and birds that mistake burial for boreal, monoculture for real habitat. Entering those corridors, finding no forage, they grow too weak to save themselves. There being no undergrowth between the spindly rows, 
planted even as a surgical hair transplant, straighter than gravestones. You can smell decayed flesh, some older, some fresher, in stands that some equally starved elements will mistake for progressive environmental policy, but for Bernie and me, they stand for ignorance, avarice, and mendacity, culture's pure antipodes. If to cultivate is to care, as it follows the word we, no pretense there, only commercial usury, where those two, who could be twins or one model superimposed, are drugged and dumped on that sterile plain for the camera to ravage with auto lens and for teenagers with starving eyes who auto-cannibalize. But all social difference and biodiversity aside, my buddy in size 40, straight leg jeans, lumberjack shirt, short back and sides, timber wolf tattoo, says we should be up there showing everybody how it's done before no one has the strength anymore even to lie. Non-consultant. Took the subway to Bay and Bloor, joining a lone briefcaser on the southbound ramp in his periodic step across the caution line to probe the oracular tunnel. I saw past the distinctions of his unknown business, refinement, and stress to a vague affinity with one whose years equaled mine. For just a breath was that sister's confessing wind on a thistle hush, then pock. He sprawled, and I hugged the floor as a toddler would his mother, hoping the shot had come from a low angle on my belly crawling a body length toward the red nimbus fanning out from his head. Basic as it is, blood always surprises. When a seemingly cool crucible erupts, molten iron, more viscous than told by its quick flow, adhering to nostril and reflective eye, redolent as a bouquet of metal roses, it slicked my hand while I sought a pressure point. Carotid, jugular, the rolled up star tucked under. His ear spoke a fluent half liter per second, convulsing as in agitation one jars a near empty condiment bottle, finishing when the medical team blew in to brush me off and calm the fallen, who by then recalled a herring left in a creel. They hoisted him onto the stretcher, still and pale as the station interior. Custodians closed in as though it were their family secret, but I wore the private massacre inside out of that place, fresh painted with intimate gore non-consultant midwife to a burst aneurysm. Requiem for Hugh. This goes out to my friend who I just met. Rocking a bit as it burns out on the lake. So far, I can't make it out. Fathomless are the clouds and my concerns with our loss. I'm not among the drive-through mourners, their jiffy grief, disposable shrouds. I take no souvenir from your stuff, no keepsake from your few belongings. It's enough to recall your brow furrowed at the news, your end too quick to ponder, 
too ponderous to call merciful. You, the kind, easygoing kind, least easy to let go. I saw you drop half yourself, calling it goodbye. All hope you'd recover gone south, past the farms. Over to your palliative outpost. When all talk was done, and your mouth no longer could request a clean cloth to wipe its corners. There should have been the gentlest hand holding yours, and holding you strong arms that if they rocked you forever, couldn't rock you enough. You smile. Aphrodisiacs are a myth. Warm in our hot apartment, your kiss wet outside on that stormy afternoon. First barbecue, cool new grass, huge pink blossoms crowd the trellis. Breezes dry my bicycle riding sweat. I take a tepid shower and rub cocoa butter on my spring sunburn. Dark chocolate from the refrigerator melts into a mouthful of coffee. Open windows, traffic passing late, single sheet on our double bed. A candle wavers under your breath. Narcotic light from our waxen bodies. Those elixirs which don't exist. Aeolian song. Circling the square, you recall yourself. Along the mesh fence, flyers get a chance to be vertical again. Aluminum cans lament their emptiness. Whatever you upset retains a little sorrow. You alone are a bit sad. Whenever you moan, you console yourself. If you cry, you dry your own tears whistle and more of you comes. Your smile is Earth's curvature, 
and ethereal nimbus, your lips the red surf lapping as dawn breaks. Wherever you go, trees laugh as water tries to follow. You worry all that swim, walk, and fly, but you never worry. You care for none, but you have done more than all who claim to care. If you could love, you would have conditions. Even at your steadiest, you subside, blowing aimless kisses. Even as you move me, you leave me. Even as you convince me what I cast your way will not return, you return what I suppose to be lost forever. You expose graves and treasures, play the original hymn and eternal anthem, forget sun worship or devotion to the moon, I bow down to you who carve cathedrals from stone, slam the screen door after stealing the local news, jet without pilot, stream without banks, who infuses the polar ice cap with pollen, tender to the yielding, brutal to the rigid, who tests the green shoot, cripples the autumn stalk, who stifles the flame, drives the wildfire wild, who puts particles in the eye, engulfs the ear, notorious bewitcher, Though you drive me to distraction or onto the rocks, the siren is only you in the rigging. You who fill the sail can tear it. You who propel my boat may capsize it. As if to emphasize, no treachery exceeds that of the otherwise faithful. At liberty to liberate from its foundation, make me board up or vacate my house. You make yourself welcome and accommodate the planet you encompass. Nor'westerly, southeasterly, north by northeast, south by southwest, weather saw, weather cock or vein may indicate, but you don't know where to go until you have come. Before I know it, you're after me. Your every choice at once a consequence, changing as you are the same, changing, occasional, and for every occasion. If I grow flowers, you are perfume. If I spread poison, you are an executioner. But coming clean to the mill tower blades, you force on with integrity and a conscience clear as any without one. Never bored, given all you excite. However much you gather, you never stop to think. Never impatient, always gratified. You never arbitrate. By intervening, you settle nothing. As I confront you, my account is heard behind me. With you at my back, my predictions precede me. However many words I have, I have to no handle for you. Respire, perspire, aspire, conspire, and expire as I will. Whatsoever may transpire cannot hold a candle to you. Whatever you empower must wait. Whomever fights you forfeits dignity. Whatever fetters you abandon fall. Statues erode where they stand. Whomever you marry never sleeps. Whenever you sleep, dust gathers. Whomever trusts you is misguided. Whomever you heal is healthier than without you. None of us is like you. None of us except the child who by a kite string forms attachments. Likens to a lullaby your warmth awakens to your chill and is lifted, while some ignore and others are bothered by you. I have grown into your loose fit, and in growing older, suit you 
more and more content with you as you are content with you as you are. Yes. So, just to, so you won't think that it's all doom and gloom, there's a song entitled Nudity, and I'd like to thank Kirk Felix for accompanying me on guitar as well. It certainly makes it easy when he falls into the cadence of whatever I have to say. Here's a poem that was published by the Dalhousie Review quite a few years ago. It's called Nudity. Nothing is a basic necessity and a mode of personal expression. Though I could never justify spending a lot of hard-earned money on nothing, I can appreciate the need for special protective nothing on some jobs and strict uniformity of nothing for public servants or the military. However, certain vacuous people seem obsessed with recent trends in nothing. Granted, all my conceptions about nothing are equally based on fashion. She was the daughter of a wealthy nothing manufacturer. But regardless of quality or style, her nothing suited her. Occasionally, she would wear, wear my nothing, and I would wear hers, especially our most comfortable articles of nothing. I could remember her remarking once how nothing makes the man. Come to think of it, my nothing was a reflection of her taste. Fearing clothing, I consented to go to an apparel beach. There were people pretending not to notice everyone wearing clothing, and others who came expressly to look at people wearing clothing. Ever notice when you got clothing on, the careful placement of hands? The sense of having clothing to cover you is a bit disturbing. Anyway, we concluded wearing clothing is an intimate thing. It was obvious we had clothing in common. Even so, I believed with all my heart that clothing could tear us apart. And for three years, clothing did. Then, one fateful day, I noticed our lives had become shrouded in a kind of clothingness. After that, no matter what I did, clothing seemed to please her. And now that she is gone, I am left with clothing but nothing. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I think that that concludes today, doesn't it? Is, yeah? Okay. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to thank all of you for coming out. I'd like to thank our features, Luciano and Rob and Margaret and Tom and all the open mics. You were all wonderful. Uh, it's a beautiful afternoon. Um, just delighted and grateful. And, um, and thank you to the library. <laughs> so helpful um, and to our sound technician. Um, okay, well, thank you so much. You've been absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much.